up one nice one, get sorted. When I used to live in Tlaethi, this guy came back from the army. He was like, he'd just come back from Germany and he, with his Nike jacket on and they were like, oh, what's, and he started going out with my mate's sister. And my mate was like, oh, he's, he can break dance. Like, and I was like, well, what the hell's that? So he started teaching us how to break dance. And funny enough, it just started, it just started kicking off in the UK at the time. So yeah, he started, we started break dancing and then uh, we did that for a few years. We were very good. So that progressed then into the to the music when the break dancing sort of died down a little bit. Um, the graf- graffiti and uh, um, and the DJing took over then. So I got a bit into a bit of trouble with the graffiti. So that I had to knock that in the head. And the only thing that kept me out of trouble really was just sitting in my bedroom uh, on my decks all night. So I used to, I was an avid hip hop collector at the time. So I used to travel. I remember I used to have like a part time job in school as a as a a barman, believe it or not, <laughs> I was only like 15. Um, in, the, in the Diplomat Hotel in Flatley, I, I worked there and I, um, I saved my money and I went to London every weekend and bought records from Groove Records and all those classic sort of hip hop shops back in the Soho in London. Um, so I loved it. Then bought my first Technic deck and bought, bought another one then about six months after because it was a lot of money back then. I remember buying my first one and I bought it from an electrical shop. It's an FE, I think it's by the Thomas Arms somewhere. And I, I, I had the box and I, it was only like 15 or 16, 15 maybe. And it was heavy. Like I, I lived quite a long way from that shop. So I had to carry it all the way home. And I just, you know, this, the smell of it and the, and the vinyl and 
I loved it, so I saved up for another one then. Um, but when I used to break dance, we used to come up to Swansea quite a lot. Um, so we made a couple of friends in Swansea, um, one being the, uh, the infamous DJ Demo, um, Darren McCarthy and Nicky Pfeiffer, and um, they had a crew called the Misfits. Um, we used to do a lot of graffiti, we used to do break dancing. I used to meet them all the time in concerts um, around the country as well, when we used to go to like, Nottingham. I bumped into them in the street in Nottingham once. I think that's when we really hit it off in, a, in, a, in about 87. Um, and then um, they were just like walking up the street, all of them, all the Manston boys, misfits. And I was like, hey, boys. And they were like, bloody hell, what are you doing up here? I was like, oh, my sister lives in Matthew in Nottingham. So I come up to Rock City all the time to watch all the gigs. So, um, yeah, so we hooked up and obviously Alfie did a demo at his realistic then and he just bought he just bought Technics as well. Um, so I, I just like, was in awe of, of, of Alfie watching him cutting and scratching. Um, you know, we just lived up there. Uh, Sean would do a bit of rapping and there's another guy called John who used to do a bit of rapping. And we, through that, um, sort of constant um, music influence with Demo because he used to enter the DMC competitions. Um, so we used to love the DMC competitions. We'd like watch the videos all the time. It was 1987 World Championships, 1988 World Championships. And I think Demo entered in 1989 for the first time, I think it was, or 88. Um, and he got like sort of ripped off a little bit. I think what was he came third in Swansea. And if you came third, you'd have an opportunity to play in another competition in another part of the country. So we went to um, Bristol. We went to the Papillons in Bristol. We thought, well, that's the nearest place for us. So we went up there in the daytime then. You'd go into the club and there'd be like 30 DJs there and they'd all do their sets and the MC then would pick the best six or seven to go through to the night. So um, so Alfie had to do it from scratch again. So obviously he got through to the night and there was another DJ there called Bungie. Uh, you could say 80, 88, 89. Um, we got to know Bungie really well. Um, so we, 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 we had like a Bristol connection then. Bungie come and stay with us. We go and stay with Bungie up in Nor West and... Yeah, the friendship evolved from that, and uh, it never, it never really left. So I met John Nation through Bungie back in the day uh, with the hip hop stuff, and then um, we always kept in contact because they used to like the graffiti. So John Nation used to be the youth coordinator in Barton Hill Youth Centre in Bristol, which was sort of Bristol's graffiti hall of fame at the time. And um, so we used to go up there and look at graffiti, and we noticed that John was starting to rave. And John Nation used to um, run coaches from Bristol to various big parties around the country. So we used to get a lot of flyers from uh, John Nation. That's how we, I think that's how we found out about Ring Dance in Jennings Lane through John, because he used to have all the flyers in, in the youth centre. That's, that's our link with John up there. We were into hip hop, we were making music. We had a little studio going in, in Bristol. Uh, during that time, um, I, w I was always like the wild one anyway. I think they probably probably admit it a little bit I, I got into rave so I, I was an avid hip-hop head so I've been hip-hop since you know the days of break dancing the PT DJ and bedroom DJ and DMC competition traveling up and down the country to watch people like Schooly D Public Enemy you know uh, LL Cool J Run DMC uh, we've seen, seen loads and loads of bands I used to love going up to the, you know all the shows watching all the shows um, so I was an avid hip-hop head and all of a sudden light switched and I was a raver. I heard about it, but I wasn't a hip hop head, so I was like, oh, Reavers, but I came off heads. And then 88 days, so I was thinking, oh, it's starting to break into the music, you know, you could hear it in the clubs and stuff. 89, there was a change then. I don't know what happened, but I got into it. Um, as, as an avid hip hop head, it was kind of like a big thing to switch music. Um, 
a lot of DJs did it uh, around that time. Nicky Black Market did it. He was, you know, a big hip hop DJ. Slipmat, another one. He was a DMC. We used to see Slipmat in the DMC heats all the time. Um, along with uh, DJ Hype, Dr. K, he was known then in DMC days. A lot, so a lot of them switched. So I didn't feel too bad about it. Yeah, but I thought, well, hey, if I can do spin backs and cut in and scratching and all that, these these DJs are just mixing one record into another. It should should be too hard. To, yeah, that's so I started getting into, you know, a couple of the boys I knew, they had a few rave records. I used to sort of mix them together. And then we just, so I, I did like a small rave collection and, and a group of friends in Swansea who had a, a, a sort of, um, say it's the same interests as, as myself. It must have only been about 20 of us. Um, we go to um, go down to the car parks in Oxwich in the night and play the music and do what ravers do. I sort of go to um, little clubs, um, basement parties in, in, in Swansea. We used to do, like I said, it wasn't many of us, 20, 20 30 of us. We, we travel in a, in a group there, maybe go up to Rain Dance in London or local to Astoria or whatever, you know, whatever party we wanted to go to. We thought, the long way to these parties, why don't we start doing some ourselves? I was with Jez and, and um, Niblo and John Sermon um, at the time, and they were like, "Well, let's um, let's start our own thing." Then, so we went to uh, we, had, we went to go see Dora's because the boys went to Dora's. I I never been there before. I didn't even know it existed. So we went down to see the owner, and he said, "Yeah, yeah, just do a Thursday night, then, boys." I think we did about three of them there. I think one first one we had you know a couple hundred people. You know, me and John Paul were DJing because we were the only DJs then. With John Paul, John Paul was the other half of the TikTok crew. He would come down to Swansea, um, and we'd we'd met him in a legendary house called the One Fourteen King Edward Road. So John instantly, me and John hit it off because I was a DJ, I was a hip hop DJ, but he was uh, he was already into house music and Balearic. Um So we, we hit it off. Uh, John always played the low down stuff, and I always went for the high tempo. So we played two hours. And then I play the two hours as well. And that was it. That's how we went for quite a long time, actually. And then uh, Jamo came along then. So we went. We did one in Dora's. First one was about 200 people. Second one, I think, was about the same. The second one, it snowed. Uh, it started snowing before the, the, the party. And then um, when we came out at 2 o'clock in the morning, the snow was like literally over the cars. And it was just having snowball fights. And it was just crazy. You know, especially when you come out at that time in the morning. We used to go to Martha's every Monday anyway for Jeff Thomas. So we'd go to Soul Nights because he used to play hip hop and stuff. And we still go there when when, when we were ravers because he'd, he'd play a couple of tracks. And um, he'd have sometimes you have some bands now. I remember Homeboy Hippie and a Funky Dread came down once. They stayed in the house with us when they had that uh, total confusion hit out. So Tony Carpenter approached us and he said, Hey, do you want to do the Friday? I said, Yeah, yeah, that sounds good. When do you want us to do it? You know, because we're only doing them once a month in Doris. He goes, well, why didn't you do this Friday? I said, but well, I remember, I don't know what day it was, but I remember I was thinking, hold on, that, that's only a couple of days away. Cut a little deal with him. We thought, well, we'll give it a bash in it. So first Friday, absolutely sold out. So he was at the door. We thought, Tony was like, what the fuck's going on here? And I said, I didn't know. Fucking hell. I didn't know. One minute we'd gone from like 200 people in Doris, the next minute we you know, we got six, 700 people queuing outside. It must have been because it was Friday night. And the word had gone around and it, it just went from craziness to craziness. The TikTok was, uh, was from Martha's. You could queue all the way around the corner. Sometimes the queue would be past the, the, the bar next door and up the hill. You know, it was, it was, it was huge. Yeah, it was, it was uh, crazy. This is a journey, this is a journey, this is a journey into sound. During that time, it must have been, well, it was January 1991 was our first one we did in Martha's. Oh no, it was Dora's. Around that time, I think me and Niblo went down to Dora's on a Saturday night. <laughs> of all places, I don't know what we, we decided. We must have been sat in the house and thought, come on, let's go down Dora's for a Saturday night. But, uh, 
we went down the doors and I said, oh, let's get out here, let's, let's go down to university. Apparently there's some sort of party the students are doing down there. So let's go down and have a look. So we went down there and we were like, walked into the refectory and there's like all lasers and we're like, wow, look at this place. What's, what's, what's all this about then? This is a, the music's a bit shit, but the setup's fucking awesome. We, you know, we, we should be doing something here. Yeah? But we met Paul, Paul Whittaker in there. And we, we just said the same to him, we said, hey, Paul, great, you know, you, great party, just shit music. We were quite blunt. So he said, oh, right, okay, then uh, all you guys will be like, oh, we're doing the TikTok nights in, in Martha's, you know. So, you know, we're getting like six, well, we're getting legally 600 people through the door, but we're probably getting more to 800 to 900 sometimes. So we could probably even turn over 1,200 uh, uh, through people going in and out and people sneaking in. So he's like, oh, okay, um, well, um, that's, um, you know, the refectory owes 800 people. Uh, you, do the D- you do the DJ on the next one. I was like, okay, it's a problem. I think he had um, Evil Eddie Richards, I think his first one was. So, anyways, you know, it was good. It was packed. And then I think he had Jumping Jack Frost in the second one. And then he started getting a little packed, but a bit busier. We had a couple at some point. I think we started going every fortnight. I th- all I know is we did 13 pulses. That's what I know. And they were all pretty busy. The, 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 the most memorable one would be the Shades of Rhythm uh, at the Pulse. That, 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 that was just crazy. I remember a coach arriving as we were leaving, because it shut at 2 o'clock. And a coach arrived from fucking the Midlands. And I, we're like, oh, it's shut. Like, no, it's we shut. We're like, oh, no, we just got you. What the fuck? How do you know about Pulse? But everyone was coming down. Yeah, once, once, you know, because we were good friends of the Easy Group, Easy Group would come down. And he'd bring like different promoters down with him. Go, oh, come and check these guys out down in Wales. Like, see what they're doing. They come to Martha's on a Friday, which was the night before Pulse. It was still busy, so it didn't affect us whatsoever. And then uh, they'd stay with us in Martha's, and then they come down to Pulse on Saturday, spend all weekend with us. And that's how I got to know all most of the promoters I played with. So they would come down to Day, stay. Look, you're doing a good thing in Wales. Let's try and um, recreate that uh, across the bridge. And uh, that's when I used to get a lot of my bookings then and, you know, you get the following, the Welsh following. Uh, it sort of exploded from there. Yeah, TikTok, Martha's, seven years, I think we were there every Friday. Yeah, I took, um, I think about 92, I, I, I left TikTok because I was just getting too many bookings. So I was never there. I didn't have the uh, time to to run a club and right, everything's going on. So I said to Jez, why didn't you, you know, you run it? And he's going, oh, I'll get um, John Parry. I said, yeah, go for it. Because John Parry was doing a kinetic thing at the time. I said, yeah, I, I'm, I'm fine with that. Just give me a couple of bookings every now and then when I'm not doing anything. I'll be cool with that. And then uh, John John Parry took it over for, uh, for a couple of years then with Kinetic, with Arrow. Yeah, he's a really nice guy. Got a lot of time for people. You know, they did all right there. And um, I think the music scene, I think mu- musically, I think that something was changing within John and Arrow. His music tastes were changing. He tried to um, influence the Martha's crowd into that style of music. They were having none of it. Um, I think John left Martha's then. Tony Carpenter rang me up. He goes, uh, John's leaving. Do you want to come back to Martha's? I said, um, yeah, yeah, I'll I'll come back. And so John left and then he went off to um, start the escape club. Some little club across the road. Uh, yeah, yeah, Danny joined forces with them then because he was doing well. He was up for it down in down your neck of the woods. So they went to escape. I went back into Martha's. Slap bang, just before the happy hardcore scene started to kick off. And I caught that wave perfectly then for a few years through Martha's. We were getting Clarky Slip Maps, I do by Dwyer or Loft Proof, HMF Scorpio producer, uh, Nicky Blackmark, uh, Mickey Finn. Every, we get everyone down. We were just having some of the lineups. I'm looking at the flyers the other day and thinking, fuck, you know, how many DJs did I put on in one night? I didn't make any money there when I did when I went back there. What I did, it did put us on the map because a lot of DJs are playing there. We'd have like four or five, sometimes have six headliners. I was like, what are you doing? One would have done it. Yeah, but we did have a lot of DJs. And I brought a lot of DJs down from other residents from around the country as well because I was playing clubs across the country. I can go anywhere and then know somebody and stay with somebody and, and you know, be, feel safe with someone. And those friends, uh, you know, I said, look, I'm down to Swansea. I'll, 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 I'll pay you back. And... Uh, you know, come down and play the club. So we had DJs come down from Sheffield, Dream, 
Birmingham, from Barnstable, Plymouth, and you know, it's DJs come down from everywhere. During that time, I think uh, Mr. Jeremy Hill, Jazzy, uh, a little uh, holiday, should we say? Um, so when he came back, then I think the scene, the scene was 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 in a bad state. I think it for some for some reason about 98, 1998, it just the scene just seemed to disappear overnight. Oh, lots lots of people went under, yeah. The people who stuck with it, it paid off for them. You know, the, the, the techno scene didn't die. So producer and Scorpio and all that, they kept it. They kept it going. Luke's producer is doing really well now abroad. Scorpio says still speak to Simon every now and then. And, you know, he's doing well. Marky G did well. Marky G crossed over. Um, the people like Carly and Juice then, they started their bionic thing. And, their, you know, the music sort of went that way for the, maybe the harder element. And the house element then, you know, went to, went to escape. Um, so hardcore just struggled a little bit. It still went on, but it was very small. Traditionally, the TikTok to birthday party should be in January. The TikTok was formed in December 1990, and that was our first party, our first official, our first party not in the club. Our first club party was January 1991. I think it was the 31st of January. Then it was, uh, you know, Thatcher's government. There was not much going on. Nobody had any jobs. We didn't have any jobs. You know, it, was, it was a tough time in the UK, uh, you know, during the late 80s and early 90s. I don't think we we never did it for the money. I suppose, you know, I was I was lucky enough to, to have a little bit of savings back then to get us off the ground. Um, I don't think any of the boys had any money to do it. So it was a gamble for us. It wasn't much because obviously me and John Paul were DJing. So we didn't have any overheads. The only overhead we had was paying the club owners. And, uh, you know, as long as we had a few people for the door, we were always all right. And I don't think we ever lost any money in the first five years of it, or something like that. So, um, no, it was never about the money. It was more about just having a good time with your friends. And we, we you know, with the Swansea crew, we got about, didn't we? <laughs> you hear the mixtapes now, and uh, listening to the old mixtape Fantasia, they always gave a shout out there, everywhere. You know, we had, we had a good following, we had a good crowd. We had, people come, loved to come to Swansea to dance. It was just same as West Wales, no, no, vibe, you know, no, no bad vibes. It was all everyone get on with each other. But I, just you just lived, breathed, you know, every, the whole rave thing. It was, I, I didn't work. So TikTok in the beginning was my life. DJing was my life. So all I did is listen to music and, you know, focus and trying to get a play somewhere that you know that I haven't played before. I, I was lucky enough to um, I used to buy my records from Replay Records in Bristol because obviously, as previously said, it, you know we we had quite close connections with Bristol with Bungie, so I knew Bristol quite well, so I, I knew where all the record shops were. So um, I go to Replay Records in Bristol and I'd be there like twice a week, so sort of just buying up all the tunes. Um, when you get to know one behind the, behind the shop counter, you, you know, he'd be like, oh, I've got this one here. I think, oh, yeah, I'll have that. <laughs> he used to give me another pile like that then, all, all European techno stuff, and then he had a few, the, the white labels started coming in then, and the breakbeat stuff. I'd be in there with Dennis, wouldn't I? Dennis Easy Group. So Dennis would have his stack, I'd have my stack, we'd talk, and I'd be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And as soon as I was like, I come down to Swansea. And he's like, yeah, I will. And he came down to Swansea, and that, you know, that was it then, really. He was down every weekend. He'd be like playing or whatever he did around the country. And then after that, he'd come down to Swansea and stay with us. And he'd bring different people down all the time and we'd network in. And it was great. And Dennis would then, you know, I used to say to Ribs, oh, what's about Dennis? I would have got my first play. Ribs would, no, you got your first play. You did, you did. <laughs> it's like, oh, no, I do. We could take my hand off to Dennis. I think he got me through the door with, um, I think it was Ectos in Swindon. I think um, Midge and the boys came down to Swansea with Dennis and, uh, we got to know him really well, and um, before you know it, Midge from Ecto, they had a club in Swindon called the Monkey Club, where they used to do regular nights, and unfortunately I never went there. Um, but the, Midge was organising a big party outside. Uh, because first Ectos was, you know, it was, must have been catered for about 5,000 people. There was only, I don't know how many people were there the first night, probably 3,000, but the second one they did, uh, that, that was a different story. So the second one was huge. There must have been about 10,000 people there. Uh, Moby, yeah, Moby was on there. It was, uh, I think it was me, Groove Rider, Easy Groove, um, Doc Scott, uh, Carl Cox. So I had to play after Carl Cox. <laughs> that was fun. I remember Lisa, DJ Lisa, like me and Lisa were up on the decks on the stage and Carl was there doing his always three, 
three decks it and Lisa's going, how are you going to play after him? I was like, oh, no. It was like two in the morning. I was like, well, I don't know why, why they put me on that time in the morning. I don't know. So for this next song, this next song needs a little introduction, but I'll keep it short because I know I'm a loud mouth, so I won't talk too much. But I would like to dedicate this next song. Well, the first time I ever came to the UK was in 1991. And I played at a big outdoor rave in 1991, and I thought it was the greatest thing I had ever experienced. Back then, it was 10,000 people in a field somewhere near Bristol, and it was the most exciting thing in the world. So for this next song, I would like to dedicate this no next song to everybody here and to that original spirit of people dancing outside until 7 o'clock in the morning. Thank you. DJ Lomas bringing the hot tool vibe. All the people in the crowd come alive. Yeah, Fantasia, we got the energy. Exeter crew, Bristol crew, Plymouth crew, Swansea crew. Come on! The hot tool has arrived. then became um, we became friendly with Gideon from Fantasia. Um, so the next minute I'm on Fantasias, the next minute I'm on Rain Dances, the next minute I'm on Rapidos or whatever, uh, all over the place. <laughs> Fuck off parties, you know, perception and yeah, doing a parties with twenty thousand people in the universe, tribal gathering. You know, Fantasia, you know, they all, all these promoters, they all came from Cheltenham. It was mad. It was, Cheltenham was like a hotbed of promoters. But um, it just seemed like the West Country just had its own feel. We, I remember me and Dennis, we used to hate going to London, you know. We used to go, oh. Usually after we play somewhere, we head back to uh, the West Country and then go to a free party somewhere. And we were going to London, doing, Dennis do his thing, like, let's get out there. It just came, like, became like a... You know, the fun was gone then. I was going up to London thinking, I don't really want to be here. I'd rather be in a free party in maybe Stroud or Bath or, or Letchley or Oxford. You know, that, we, that's what we'd be doing every weekend. Free parties, big parties, clubs in the West Country. Yeah, we used to go to clubs all over the West Country. It was great. I, I have no complaints whatsoever. I, I love DJing in the West Country. Some of my finest places I used to go to. We used to go to Cornwall a lot. We used to go down to Newquay, Penzance. Yeah, there was a club that Shy Horse in Cornwall. Newquay was a good one. Um, Cornwall Coliseum with the Dance Planets on Plymouth Warehouse. Um, Revelations in uh, Taunton. Paulick Manor, um, Vivian Manor. Pyro Court in Hereford. That was an amazing one with uh, which Mark used to do. Um, we stayed there all weekend. That was that was great fun. And come to the basketballs. Brunel Rooms, Swindon, Gold Diggers, you know, all, all fantastic clubs, um, um, which which I, I really enjoy playing. It's, you know, I enjoy playing everywhere, but they just, it just it's just the travelling. It was, it was much easier for me being living in Swansea. Uh, you know, I love playing in you know, Uprising in Sheffield or Doncaster Warehouses and places like that, but um, yeah, they, they were a long way away from home, um, which, which, you know, which burnt, burnt, burnt me out a little bit towards the end. Castle Morton was like there was there was a lot happening before Castle Morton. 
a lot of people, well, most of the people in the Oxford, Swindon, Bristol area would know when you see. I think it was a, there was a few parties in the lead up to that, I think. But I remember, that was, I think Chip, Chip and Sobby was happening. I think Letch Lead was one. I think Letch Lead may have been the week before Chip um, Castle Morton. I think it was one in Oxford as well. They were getting big. You now we've been going to them since, you know, you'd have a couple of thousand people. And now that were, we're talking like they were getting quite big now. Cause they were getting like, you know, near 10,000 people. So literally it was massive. I think, I think Toppers, Toppers or somebody were there that day. I think they were. They obviously Dennis run the, uh, Dennis could go on any sound system he wanted to. You know, I, I could go with Spiral Tribe with DJ Die from uh, uh, Ronnie and all those boys in Bristol. They, they'd all be there. And, you know, we'd all have our little sound systems. We'd all know the people. We could all get, we could all get the much guarantee our place. And then literally was huge. That, that was a big one. I was thinking, oh, let's right, get And I went, to, I was playing in Torbay, I think it was, on a, on a Friday night in a leisure centre in Torbay. I think the guys, the guys who were driving me at the time, I can't remember, it might have been Barry in Port Talbot, driving me at the time. And we went to Torbay and I thought, right, boys, party in Castle Morton. Should we give it a shot, like? Right? Yeah, so left all bed. I think it was like two in the morning. I think he shut down there. I remember sleeping in the car and then Barry waking me up going, oh, oh. I was like, look at this. I mean, in a field. And I got out and I was like, fuck. I said, like, where the fuck are you, are you park any fucking close to the walk? You can't, you can't even see the party. It was just fields and fields and fields of fucking cars. I was like, fuck. I didn't realise what how big it was at the time. It was... Uh, we were, getting, we were getting quite used to police helicopters flying over us at uh, you know, the previous parties before Castle Morton. But like that, that was, uh, yeah, you know, Criminal Justice Act all over. Everyone get basically the club culture, give the, give the uh, club culture the boost it wanted. And people like Cream, Gate Crasher and all that sort of cleaned up from that. It all a bit of a blur, Castle Morton was, to be honest. I can't remember how many days I was there. But I remember ringing people. I had a phone then. I had a mobile phone. 1991, I had a mobile phone. It was about that big. <laughs> <laughs> it had a, it had a big, big plastic aerial on top of it. Um, it like a, I paid about like 500 quid for it. I tell you who sold me the phone. It was Mike Truman from Hybrid. He used to work in up on his car radio. I had to pay like a 400 pound deposit for it. And like 400 pound phone or something. It was fucking huge. Like that. I was like, but I could get all to the three parties then, couldn't I? Like a phone. Like, where's the free party up here? Right, we'll be there now. Because there was only like Derek's records to buy records and Swansea at the time. It was great for me because everything came in Derek's. I had one copy kept every, of everything. So I'd just go in there, I'd have, open my bag up, whatever I didn't want, anyone else would have. But he wouldn't have multiple copies. He'd only, he'd only have maybe one or two. So, and I'd have one of them everyone so um so they started a record shop um just down the road um up in the top of the building somewhere a small little room so um jammer was there so i go up there and see what they got and stuff and uh, i thought oh guys you know you, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot happening at the time you know the um the hardcore scene was having a bit of a resurgence after the after the dark sort of 93 1983 went a bit dark to it the, the whole scene it was having a bit of resurgence. You could feel the the, the techno and the, um, the hardcore happy. Uh, they, they end up being called happy hardcore, but the, the uplifting hardcore, should we say, as it was back in the uh, yeah, late part of '93, and, and that was a different scene. Uh, so uh, back then, it was like back in the early days. It was all one music, and we play anything. And then, uh, you know, you get Sasha, John Kelly, and Groove Rider playing on the same bill. Like, you know? Yeah, so it was just at the beginning, and I thought something here we could do you know so i said like, ah tomorrow i said where are you getting all these records from then he's like oh we're doing you know stuff in london I'm like, okay i said um let's, let's go let's go up to london then and you know and uh i'll come with you <laughs> so i went perfect for me i'm going to the hub now and i usually i'm at the mercy of record shop owners and what they, what they give me what they got left and i thought you okay, know I'm, I'm in the distribution center now i can get whatever i want so we went up to Moe's Music and places like that in London. And I thought, come oh, on, boys, let's, let's get some multiple copies of, you know, sell them in the shop. So um, we started buying a lot. Some of the, started meeting a few people up there. Some people already knew who I was uh, back then. 
and uh, they were like, keep in touch with me and I'll be like, right, we're going to say, we won't go back up this time, but will you just let us know anything that's hot? And they were like, yeah, this is hot. And I was like, well, we'll have 10 copies of that. And then uh, Morris is like, oh, why don't we, uh, I said, we're going to need a bigger shop. So uh, we start, we opened, um, we opened Raid Records up in the arcade then. Went really well for about a year. It's a bit of a downside. The scenes were dying off a little bit. Um, yeah, so yeah, we, we, we were getting multiple, some copies, we'd sell about 40 or 50 copies of one record. It was just crazy. Like nothing like that had been done in Swansea before. Some clubs, if I was passing, um, they'd phone me up, say Milwaukee's rang me up and they'd be like, oh, I'm going to book you for uh, whatever, do it every day now. I'm going, oh, I can't do that, I think. Like, um, I'm, I'm in Liverpool, something like that. And they were like, oh, okay. Um, when you're passing, I was like, oh, well, I'll, be, I'll be in Great Yarmouth or something like that. And then I'm on my way to Leicester, the die yard, you know, and they were like, oh, pop in. I was like, yeah, we'll put you on a fly for that date then. And I'd pop in. Obviously, because I was passing, I wouldn't charge that much money, you know. So, yeah, I could go from Great Yarmouth to Milwaukee's and Northampton to Leicester and whatever, to Sheffield, then to Uprising, whatever. Um, yeah, so there's multiple clubs in in, uh, in a night. Good laugh, a bit tiring. Looking back at it now, it was horrible. I wouldn't like to do it now. Uh, it was the reason why I gave up, to be honest, in the, in the end, the travelling. Because I remember I was with Kipper once and we were like five o'clock, and it was well, probably later than five, probably about seven o'clock in the morning in Skegness, um, Sunday morning. I think it fuck uh, fucking five hour drive home now, man. Yeah, I think we drove from Inverness to 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 Newquay one weekend. <laughs> we see some things on the road, man. Cool. See some sights on the road. We see loads of loads of crashes and crazy things on the motorway. I, I remember Michael Reese driving me once. <laughs> we were coming we must have been coming from a free party somewhere. I, it was the, I remember the road. It was the A40 coming from Oxford, going through to Cheltenham. There was a road that sort of runs parallel to the M4, isn't it? Um, I woke up and I looked at Michael and he's asleep at the wheel. <laughs> and the car's still going. He's sleeping on the wheel. And uh, I'll let, what I must have woke me up was a do 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 And Michael's asleep on the wheel. I'm like, oh my God. Because I'm kicking him up. He's like, shit. He said, fucking how long have you been asleep? And he's like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Like, crazy. We would just drive the car, we're still going. I don't know. I'm not sure. Uh, 1996, 1985, 1996, free parties. You know, they, we weren't travelling across the bridge so much to go to free parties then. I was quite busy DJing um, and most of the time was spent travelling on the road. Um, I was all over the place at the time. We had a couple of bookings, I think, down in Aberystwyth, and we and we, we bumped into some guys down there um, who were doing free parties. Um, Adam, Jai, uh, the Eternal Crew, Snafu Sound System, Dave, you know, great guys, uh, fantastic parties, uh, and we, we, we started going to them a lot. We were inviting uh, DJs down from around the country to come, come and play as well. So Dennis was there. Um, we had Loft Groover come down, um, Scorpio came down a couple of times. Yeah, they were a great party, you know, Taliban, uh, the Reservoir, Ama amazing parties, amazing free parties. And it was around that time that, you know, we were still going to them as the music scene was changing. Um, that's when I decided to, um, we, we, we'd do a, a new night called Diversion in the Palace and try and incorporate that vibe in, in a club. Yeah, we, we, I left uh, TikTok in 1998, like that. I went, uh, had a little time out, and then I started a night called Diversion in, in the Palace, because John Parry was, uh, had left Escape then and gone to the Palace, I think it was probably 1999. So John, I remember John saying to me, he's going, oh Steve, I haven't done anything for about a year or so now, are you still up? I said, John, I said, uh, I've been going to a lot of free parties. So I was into my sort of acid techno at the time, um, me and Ziggy and, and Fugitive and the Eternal Crew uh, from Aberystwyth. So we were doing a lot of free parties. Um, met a lot of the guys down there, um, really impressed with what they were doing in the free parties. So we brought a bit of that back into the club. So we had all those guys do all the visuals and all the backdrops. And, you know, we put a lot of effort into that, into the dressing of that club. So not so much putting six headliners on this time, but maybe spending more on the deco. We had the Liberators down, and we had Chris Liberator, Aaron, uh, Julian Liberator, Colin Faber, Brenda Russell. Uh, yeah, Billy Nasty, that was a big one for us, big night like that. 
I know we, I think we have Mark St. Clair back once as well, I think. Oh, good old Mark. Old um, Swansea boy doing well in London with his, his Pendragon lights. I think Doobs from Carmarthen won the competition here. Yeah, we had to go on t- we had to go on TV up in uh, Cardiff where we were both shooting ourselves. We had to go to TV studios in Cardiff. I was, I was like, oh my god! Yeah, it was a good West Wales link uh, in, in that club with the Palace, and I think uh, a lot of people from Swansea clicked with that, and it was nice. There was good vibes in there. Just same as t- just same sort of vibe as TikTok. Really, it was the same people just growing up a little bit. I probably should say, but I'll talk about Mark Sinclair because. Um, he keeps on going on about his um, first rave he went to, and it was the one in um, Kilday Hill in Swansea. I think it was Tony Palmer's night, uh, Meaning of Life. It was on Kilday Hill, and it was it was on a it was on a slope. It was a marquee. It was on a slope. I remember it being on a slope, and we parked a car down the bottom of the field. It was pissing down with rain, absolutely hammering down, but it was still packed. I mean, we were all in this marquee. I remember like we had all these poles holding the tent up to stop the water coming in. It was just like water, you know, you're standing in the decks, like, ah, it's just water, it's just pissing down the sides. Of it. <laughs> but nobody cared, like, it was brilliant. Now, Mark Sinclair was his first party, and he always mentions it. Good, good boy, man. He done, he done really well. Watch your bass bins, I'm telling you. TikTok over the years, I've had many, many residents. Firstly, there was me and John Paul, so John Paul would have been our first. Um, then Jamo and Solo, and then not forgetting the, the man Jez then, because without Jez, I would never have started TikTok anyway. Uh, so without him, it would never have been possible anyway. But he, Jez used to do all the lights, and then uh, he think he wanted to get in on the act. So then Jez bought some Technics, and um, well, actually, no, he didn't buy Technics at first. He would just stay in my room all night, practicing on mine. I used to wake up in the morning and Jez would still be there practicing, going like, Jez, I went to bed, like, you know, I woke up and you're still on the deck, so you'd be like, yeah, yeah, I know that's right, yeah, let's go. <laughs> like, he was non-stop, so he, he had like a crash course in uh, learning to mix, and then uh, he got his own, and then he started DJing, so it was, it was Jez was what, well, obviously one of our residents then. Because there have been so many over the years, we were not just DJs, but MCs as well. Yeah, you know, we had sax, we had quite a few good MCs, actually. We had Saxon and Jamie and Shocker. They were they were like the main ones back then. We had um, when we reopened Martha's. We had uh, Active and Carly Juice. And so Turtle. It's just there was just so many. There was when we were back in like the '96 Happy Hardwood days. We had we had quite a few residents then. Like I said, the, the the main ones went on to do really good things. So a lot of our residents done really well for themselves actually. Solo went uh, went on to do his techno thing with us. Somatic responses are still doing well. So I still listen to John stuff. I spoke to Luke a few times as our producer, and he's always bumping into them in the airports because Luke plays a lot in Europe now. So they're, they're over there all the time. I'm really happy for them. Then the other ones who went on to do um, okay were uh, Carly and Juice, I suppose. Eh? Yeah, had a couple of bookings off the back of TikTok. Didn't they? I think they did all right. I think. Yeah, they they done really well. They went off to do um, the Bionic, obviously. Uh, Gary was more our resident, more than Ian. Ian used to come down and play every now and then, but they done really well. Gary went on to do great things, and Dale as well, who's still uh, still knocking about. What can you say about Active? Got a very talented DJ, who's scratching drum and bass. For a problem with Active, he's a twat. I love Active. Uh, he's a twat. <laughs> Him and his mate Kipper, no, they're funny, we had some good laughs back then. They weren't just residents, they were mates, and that's what made TikTok really, you know, work really well. We weren't just bringing in DJs from God knows wherever, making them a residence. We we based it on, he's a friend of a friend and he's good and we'll support him. And, you know, it was, TikTok's always been a, a community of, of friends. I think that's why um, our parties work so well. So yeah, we did. I, did. I didn't really mind. There's also DJ people I've pl- let play over the years who've been good friends. And what we're doing here now is we're trying to, to do the 30th anniversary. It's going to be Els next year, hopefully. We're not making any plans at the moment because we don't. We're not really sure what's happening. I don't think any promoter can put his hand on his heart at the moment and say they know what's going to happen next year in regards to clubbing festivals or anything. We're, we're all a little bit. We'll just wait and see. We might have to wait till 
you know, by June to make any decision about what we're going to do. It might be something towards the end of next year, but we are going to celebrate the 30th anniversary. The way I want to do it is that I want to be able to invite everyone who's come to TikTok for the last 30 years, whichever year you came to see us from the very beginning to the very end. So we'll try and put on as many DJs as we can who, who supported us over the years. We'll uh, try and find a venue that's suitable for everyone as well. I know a lot of people that back in the days probably are getting on a little bit now. Um, they probably don't want to travel too far. So there are there are a few venues we've got an eye on. But yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen. We want everyone to come. We'll, we'll find somewhere. Yeah, it's tricky at the moment, isn't it? You know, it's, uh, we're, on, we're in the lockdown again. We just hope that everyone out there that, that will, that's watching this and their friends and family are all safe and let's get through this together and at the end of it we'll all, we'll all have a party together. The best.